it's only our second one, but last time we had this giant pot. Uh, we got all the crawfish up from Louisiana on the same day, from, and uh, we have this giant pot in the back out. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to get started here. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. My name is Patrick Dunn. I'm the managing editor of Concentrate and on the ground Ypsilanti. Uh, we're here tonight with our panel, Ipsy's Next Generation of Leaders. Uh, we've got a great uh, panel here tonight of uh, young leaders from the Ipsy and Ipsy Township community. I'd just like to introduce you real quickly to each of them, starting on the end here with our moderator, Yan Nazaro, who is the uh, newly minted executive director of the Ypsilanti Performance Space. Congratulations, Yan. <laughs> Yan uh, was an Ipsy resident from 2000 to 2004 and uh, has been back in Ipsy since 2017. Uh, next, we have DJ Sharif, uh, the former assistant principal of Ipsy High, and uh, we're sad to have lost her from Ipsy High since uh, she joined this panel, but we're really glad that she's here tonight. Um, she has been a Washtenaw County, County resident since 2000, and she is an Ipsy High graduate. Uh, <laughs> next, we've got Morgan Foreman, a paraprofessional educator at Ypsilanti Middle School and site coordinator at the Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation Summer Playground Program. Morgan has been an Ipsy Township resident since 1990. Next, we've got Elise Jacobson, the program director of First Fridays Ypsilanti and coordinator of the Ypsilanti Downtown Development Authority. She's been an Ipsy resident since 2008. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Jermaine Dickerson is the founder of Hero Nation, and he's been an Ipsy resident since 2009. So our format here tonight is uh, Yen is going to ask the panelists some uh, questions first, and after that we're going to turn it over to you guys. We had cards on the table when you came in if you wanted to write down a question for the panelists, and we'll give you another option uh, a little later in the program if you want to write down a question to pass up to them. After about a half hour, we'll turn it over to the audience questions, and we'll aim to wrap this all up around 7.30 tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yen. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you everyone for being here this evening. I'm just going to jump right into it because we have a lot of content that I think we want to get through. Um, my first question is, what are Ipsy's greatest challenges? And I want to pose this directly at Elise first. Um, how do you think that the younger generation now can build upon the foundation of what past generations have done here? Uh, I, think, I think an important thing that younger generations are really focusing on now is uh, collaboration and partnerships uh, and, and really focusing on that. Um, without, without um, so me working at First Fridays, uh, there's no way that we could have done it without finding other people and other groups that were passionate about it. Um, <laughs> Now I'm going to pose that to DJ because specifically with your role in education, what are we building on? So I think some of the greatest challenges is the lack of innovation. I think that the inability to work together, the school district um, is in big trouble. And I think that if we don't work together to ensure that the students that we're graduating each and every year are productive members of uh, our society and our community, we are going to struggle. I think. A couple months ago when I graduated 300 plus seniors, the worry and the anguish was 300 students are graduating, but what are their lives gonna be like? Um, how much have we prepared them to truly be successful? And when we talk about access and opportunity, what does that truly look like? If they don't have the option to go to a two year or four year, are they employable, right? Those are the things we have to ask ourselves because if they aren't, we're gonna struggle. And I think for me as a young professional, I think I became assistant principal at 27. Um, I went to Ipsy High, um, I took AP classes, took honors classes, went to a four year, all those things, but I also was the exception to the rule. We need to make sure that every student that graduates from Ipsy is like me, right? And not just like cherry picking, because I think that's also a big issue. I, I want to elaborate on that a little bit because yeah. now you've said big trouble, right? Mm -hmm and you talked about the achievement and maybe not reaching those expectations that were set. Where does the big trouble start? Do you, 
Of course, we um, went through a consolidation of the t two school districts, but where do you see big trouble starting maybe before high school? I think a lack of vision, mission, values, starting from kindergarten. I think if everyone is on the same page and everyone wants what's best for kids and everyone agrees, then I don't think there are, there are gonna be a lot of issues, but I think everybody has their own agenda and everyone has different priorities. And if we aren't aligned, it's really, it's gonna be impossible for us to move forward together. We have a literacy gap, like our students are illiterate. Um, our students can't do math. Um, our teachers are frustrated. They are losing their passion. We have a teacher gap. We, we aren't producing enough teachers for our students. Um, our highest performing, highest performing college students don't wanna be teachers anymore. And, and that's, that's a struggle, because if they're not specialists in their content, how are we gonna make sure students who are already behind getting the things that they need? Morgan, how do you feel about this progress issue? How do you think that in education and in your role specifically, how do you see if everybody does come together like DJ has mentioned, what does that progress look like through collaboration? That progress looks like um, a cohesive movement forward, so forward locomotion. Um, in my role, I specifically work a lot with students one-on-one, -on -one, um, but in the summer, in my summer program, we have a partnership with the Family Learning Institute, and so we're working in the summer bridge books, and I have third graders who can't write their name. This is problematic. And so I have my staff coming to me, asking me as an educator in the community, who is teaching them? And I can ask them what school they go to, and they can tell me their teachers, and I know their teachers. So we have to re almost reignite a flame in the people who are working with the children in any capacity, educators, social workers, any of that. They have to be passionate about their job. And if they're not passionate about their job, then they need to find something else to do. But don't come into a situation where you're working with children, because when you're working with children, you're dealing with pure, raw energy. And when you have the ability to tap into that raw energy, you have the ability to make or break a child. And right now we're breaking children, not making children. Because you don't raise kids, you raise adults. And so as your children grow and parents grow or people working with children grow, there should be forward growth and measurable growth. But right now in this community, unfortunately, there's not. Um, Jermaine question for you is when you when you do when you make um, events that bring people together how do you do it in an inclusive way so I've heard our three other panelists talk about coming together and where some of the schisms exist you're really great at bringing people together how do you do that and make everyone feel welcome well the first step is listening so as I'm listening to the issues here and I've listened to the issues in the past I'm taking note of everything, attending meetings, uh, just being really aware and conscious of my surroundings. Because you know, even though I've been in Nipsey since 2009, I just now started to get you know more involved in the community since maybe 2016. And so in that span of time, I've done the best I can to to listen, to see where there there is a need, and to see how can I help address a certain need. Where's the opportunity for me to address a certain need, and uh, how can I be as impactful and, and as in, uh, effective as possible? But also getting the right people um, beside me and in front of me to help lead different initiatives, uh, to help you know, uh, collaborate with me on these different initiatives. So whenever, because you know, the, the, the mission of Hero Nation is to help you know, everyone discover the hero within. So how do we do that? Well, again, first we have to know what exactly, they, what, what is their story? You know, what issues do they have? What, what, what kind of uh, way do they want to sort of express their voice uh, whether it be through comic books, whether it be through video games or anything dealing with nerd culture, because that's, I'm a nerd, that's, I love comic <laughs> books, superheroes, that's what I do, and, but honestly, like with any fiction, like with any medium, like that has an impact too. Uh, we uh, can be extremely uh, impacted by the movies that we watch, the comic books that we read. I was just speaking with someone the other day who said that he went through an abusive situation, uh, he, he witnessed an, an abusive domestic violence situation at home, and it was a comic book that got him through that. And so that's one of the reasons I do what I do. 
Uh, but, you know, as we're still building, as we're still developing initiatives and programs, we're always listening. We're always, you know, figuring out, okay, how can we uh, make maximize success in this way? Uh, how could we get students involved in here? Like last year, we, uh, oh, I'm sorry, last year, this year, we, once we took students to see, uh, like, Black Panther, like, it was to witness the joy in their faces, like when like the news was there, to, to see them in front, in front of the cameras just talking and just glowing and having a good time, that warmed my heart so much. I, I'm, I'm a very emotional person. So it, whenever I you know, do events or whatever, I go home and I'm like, oh my God, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> like, I'm glad I, I can help out, you know. But I'm always doing my best to be self-aware and always self-reflective and saying to myself, well, how can I do better? You know, how can I use my resources, uh, the things that I could do, the people that I know to truly make a difference somewhere? And again, that all starts by listening. So, yeah. Jermaine, can you tell everybody about the crowdfund to get the students to Black Panther? How oh, much man. you asked for, how much you raised, and what did the students get out of that experience? Well, um, <laughs> of course, when the movie was, in, or well, when I knew the movie was coming out, I feel like I, I have to do something. I have to. Um, and I asked for like $3,500 on, uh, I put it out on Twitter. I said, well, is, is, is this gonna work? I mean, is it gonna work? And so I said on Twitter, because that's where I'm mostly uh, at on Twitter. Uh, I, and I said, okay, well, um, hey guys, I need $3,500 to help take over 100 youth to see Black Panther. And within like two hours, we raised like $8,000. Uh, and then, Ooh. yeah, it was amazing. And then the campaign ended at around $10,500. And with that money, I said, well, we have some extra money. Why not go the extra mile? Originally, I was gonna just have them go to a movie, but I said, let's make an, ex an, an experience. Let's uh, have uh, African drum and dance uh, people present to perform so they can get a taste of culture. Let's, uh, I used, you know, the connections I had to um, get toy donations, book donations. Again, talking about literacy. Uh, I reached out to black-owned and black-led comic books and graphic novels and literature to ensure that the children, the, the kids' students were exposed to that material. Uh, to know that they their voices can be heard and represented in that space um, and yeah we did all that we could to sort of reach out to different segments of you know different needs and that with that event and you know we were extremely thankful for that so yeah incredible yeah. thank you um, Elise could you talk about resources as Jermaine has been speaking of what challenges in resources do you find when you're organizing events or when you're working at the DDA but then what strengths does IPSI have to offset those challenges? Um, I think challenges with any organization that you start in the, in the beginning, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of oomph behind it. People are excited about something new happening. And then once it's around for a while, people are like, oh, this is already happening and they're all taken care of and um, you know, we don't really have to give extra support because we're, you, know, you, you get used to seeing something around all the time. Um, and, and that's kind of when things become hard for, I, I think, any organization is when, when people get used to your presence, and um, we, but you still need help. So um, luckily there are amazing, you know, I think everybody in this community wants to, wants to help the arts. They want to, you know, be a part of the community and um, it's just finding the right people is the, the challenge, but it's also, you know, they're out there. Morgan, I would love to hear you tackle that same question. When you see this in the schools or in the community, what are those resources that you're hoping to have on the wish list, and how do you work through those? I'm the wrong person to ask about wish list. I make these obnoxious Amazon wish lists <laughs> with things that I want. Um, what I actually see, honestly, is a reluctancy of resources, or do I really want to give to this situation? Because how is it going to benefit me? And that's something that I have encountered um, recently with a couple of initiatives that I've tried to push through. And I needed sponsors, I needed vendors, I needed that. And everybody wanted to know how it was going to benefit them rather than how it was going to benefit someone else. So I see a lack of resources, or maybe I just don't know where the resources are at. But in the other nonprofits and things that I've worked in before I went back into the educational system, um, it just seemed like nobody wanted to share. And it seemed like, if it, like I said, if they did share, they wanted to see how it was going to benefit them. 
and there should, this is your community, and that's how I look at it. And you have a, like me and DJ were talking before, you have a stake in this community, and it's gonna be what you make it. So if you don't pour anything into it, you're not gonna get anything out of it. You can't get blood out of a turnip. So um, I would like to see um, resources of programming and centers and places for students to go after school, playgrounds, parks, family resource centers. We have too much vacant space and land in this area not to build something that people can come to. But the challenge is sustaining it. And that's where I really see a problem is, like she said, when it's new, everybody wants to be on the bandwagon. Three years later, organizations are just chugging along. So as an administrator, I think we have a lot of resources at YCS. I think sometimes it's not streamlined. It's like everyone wants to help, but everyone is doing the same thing. I think that's a struggle. That can be overwhelming. But I think about organizations like Park Ridge Community Center. I think about the Corner Health Center. Um, they're willing to support our students, right? I think that sometimes our students don't know how to navigate those spaces, but I think that a lot of people, whether they're in Ipsy or Ann Arbor, they wanna support our students, but everyone wants to do the same thing, and it's not translating into impact. I think that's the, the struggle, but I think about even University of Michigan Ann Arbor, assistant principal at the middle school, Mr. White, called me, University of Michigan wants to do like a college tour for our kids, and it was a great experience. But every day I'm getting emails about something kids could do, and they'll be out of school like the whole year if we take advantage. So if they were a lot more streamlined and just more intentional, I think it could be more impactful. I've heard that a lot. I've heard that in Ipsy, as small as this town is, we are doing a lot of effort in silos. So a lot of overlap, but maybe the collaboration isn't there. Not for not wanting to, but just everybody's a little tunnel visioned and focused on what they're doing. So I'm gonna go back to a question I started asking Jermaine a little while ago. Um, Morgan, I would love for you to um, tell us a little bit about, you, you mentioned a little bit of resistance or reticence from people giving because they don't see the stake. How do we build a way of not just being inclusive, but reaching people and specifically talking about younger, even younger than millennials, mm -hmm. and maybe older, maybe some of the seniors that aren't getting out in the community that we don't see walking around. How do we reach them and how do we help them and you know have them help us? Um, I work with the foster grandparent program every day. They come to my site, they tutor our kids, they sit with our kids, and they play lots of games of Uno. Um, and we do have some great senior resources here. Um, you know, they use the A-Ride, they use, my grandmother um, uses Catholic social services to get around when I can't take her around. We have great resources for that. Um, but it's like they, like you said, it's in silos. It's like they get out, they do what they gotta do, and then they go back home. We don't have any, like a lot of follow through with stuff, but for young people, it's mentorship. It's somebody reach back for me, so I've gotta reach back for someone else. And when we fail to mentor the generation behind us, we failed that generation behind us. And we're failing ourselves because they're the people who are gonna have to take care of us. My uh, friend of mine always says, your children are gonna choose your nursing home, so treat them well. And that's very true. Um, and so what I see with the, the seniors in this area is they have a lot of great opportunities, but I don't think that they know about the opportunities that they have. Um, I had to give one of the foster grandparents a ride home and I was like, have you tried this, have you tried this? And she just didn't know. And to address part of your question, and, and this is just something that I really wanna say, I don't think Ipsy has as many problems as we think they do. But Ipsy does have reputation management control issues. I'm a native Detroiter. My grandmother brought me up here when I was about 10 months old from a situation with my parents that she had to remove me out of. But I do claim Detroit as home. And every time I go back to the neighborhood that I'm from at the corner of Puritan and Ferguson, there's no reason that that neighborhood should look the way it does. But if we're not careful, the same thing will happen here. 
It happened fast in Detroit, and it's happening fast here. And if you want to deny it, cool. But in the neighborhood that I live in, I see it. And in the area surrounding this area, because I live in the township, so in the four miles of the city of Ypsilanti, we can see it. So we have to control that reputation and so that we know that there are resources and we know that it's a valuable place to live because nobody is going to treat anything well if they don't value it. That's so powerful, thank you, Morgan. Um, Jermaine, I would like to ask you, how do we preserve our history in this community? And how do we do it in non-institutional ways? We have lovely museums, um, enriching programming, but how do we do it in non-institutional ways? Um, well, I know that one thing that we're doing uh, currently, uh, so you mean even outside of, the, outside of the university and stuff like that too? Oh man, that's a... Uh, well, you know what, actually talk to us about that project. Yeah, so uh, at EMU, uh, we've been working on a uh, history or signage project called Black Ypsilanti, a recorded history, or a history, where we are, we've been working hard to highlight uh, Ypsilanti's black history uh, in its many facets. And so the, the goal is to, uh, we've already created signs, I'm the graphic designer on the project, so you know, we work together to, to create signs and to put them uh, in different places around uh, the city. So for example, there's a sign that highlights, that tells the history about First Ward, there's another sign that t uh, tells the history about uh, Harriet Street and, and Park Ridge and the Black Business District, you know, things like that. Uh, so we're, you know, we're in that regard, I think an, an initiative is being taken. And I think another way to do that, because um, I also feel like uh, in some ways I'm not as qualified to answer this question because I'm still learning, and if I'm just gonna be honest, uh, and I'm still in that listening stage, but from what I have observed is that there is a deep concern for history being lost, uh, heritage being lost, so, uh, and I think having initiatives like even Fly Art, for example, or asking the students what they want because ultimately they're gonna be the preservers of this history, and then pouring the history back into them and asking them how they wanna preserve it, um, and sort of instilling that cycle and that, that foundation, I think that's maybe something that we could do. Yeah. DJ, how do you think that history can be preserved? Um, I think ensuring that students understand the history. I think a lot of times we don't allow our students the access of history and understand the dimensions of history so when they grow up and they mature and they navigate spaces, they cherish it and they, it's close to them. I think a lot of times our students don't value what we don't push them to value, right? They have it within them, but we just need to facilitate that knowledge um, that they need in order to be successful. Elise, question for you is, what does Ipsy look like 10 years from now? Mm, I, I, I kind of hate that question, but... Um. <laughs> I could tell by your facial expression. Yeah, um, 10 years from now, I mean, I had to answer that question in the in the article that we did, and you know, all I could come up with is that I, I hope that, you know, ten years from now, it's a little bit more evident that people take pride in the cleanliness of the city and and maybe you know prettier flowers. And the thing is, is that I like the way that Ypsilanti is now. I like the way that it was five years ago, um, and ten years ago when I moved here, and I. And I hope that um, whatever decisions that we make and how it will look in 10 years is, you know, something that we do as a whole, as a group. And, um, and I guess I just think that over the last five years or so, like what you guys Well, personally, it was, you know, um, I mean, I, I came 10 years ago um, as a 20-year-old, you know, I was a 20-year-old artist that, you know, was, 10 years ago was uh, going to these underground shows and, and it was just a different feel where now it's, now it's a little bit more organized. I, I, mean, I, pre I appreciate the way that it was 10 years ago because I was a kid. But, um, and that's the reason I stayed here is there was a charm in Ipsy and you know, uh, I, I came from a town where people were saying Ipsy's not a good place to be and I, I wanted to see through that and I did. Um, so in 10 years, I. I don't know. I just I hope that it's something that that is is good for all of us. I hope that you know we have some pretty purple flowers and I don't know. That's it. <laughs> Anybody tackle that one? Yeah. Ten years. 
Um, I polled a few people from my network and asked them what would their ideal Ipsy look like because my ideal Ipsy looks very simple. I just want coffee closer to my house in the morning. Um, so, but this is something that I hate and someone brought it up. Ipsy has always looked at or gets a reputation as Ann Arbor's younger sister or the little sister. And that's just simply false. It is its own place and it needs its own identity. It has a lot of diversity and it's welcomed here, but it's also celebrated. And we think that diversity and inclusion and things are celebrated in Ann Arbor. But if you think about Ann Arbor, and I really want you to think about it, it is one of the most over-policed areas in the nation. It is not diverse, though inclusive because of the university, but that university isn't even inclusive. And we can be real about it. We can look at enrollment numbers, we can look at facts, we can look at statistics. That university is not an inclusive place. So Ipsy has real people here. It has people building lives, it has people building families. And I wanna see that continue to grow. I want people to build their lives. I want people to build their families. People can earn a degree in Ypsilanti. People can build businesses in Ypsilanti. And we don't always have to look towards Big Sister for the resources or a pull down or a trickle down. We can do it here. So like I said, that goes back to reputation management control. We need to control the reputation by telling our stories, by sharing our narratives of our town and where we live. That's the only way that the truth is going to be told. So for me, I was a school of choice student at Ipsy. So my parents lived in Ann Arbor and we chose uh, to come to Ypsilanti. We moved from Harlem, New York, where I was just accustomed, honestly, to black and brown, right? And then I came to Ann Arbor and it was just overwhelming. And my mother working at St. Joseph spoke to a couple uh, nurses and they said that Ipsy was more diverse. And it was the best decision I ever made and my family made, right? So for me, being a Washtenaw County resident, living in Ann Arbor, but choosing Ipsy, there's rich history, there's culture, um, there's a different facet, and I think that we need to acknowledge that. I also think that even being 12 years old and being a part of um, organizations and being an agent of change and being engaged at a young age, going to city council meetings at 11, 12 years old, like. I want a community center, and I think this is, we need a seat at the table uh, with <laughs> Nicole and other stakeholders. It's what activated my commitment to Ipsy, even though I wasn't born in Ipsy and I didn't live in Ipsy. So in 10 years, what I wanna see is that people authentically and genuinely supporting younger folks. Because it's very interesting. When I was younger, it was cute, right? Now that I have an opinion, it's a threat. And so I think, although I have my own personality and you've mentored me or you've supported me or whatever you've done, understand that I have my own personality and understand that I have my own philosophy. Um, so the innovation that I wanna bring, at least give it a chance, but there's a hesitation that I can't even fail in front of people who've mentored me because I think they're actually rooting for my failure. So it, it's a very sticky situation, so if we don't, change our mindset to innovation and open our minds, in 10 years we're gonna be having the same conversation with, with no type of change or impact. Um, I wanna, so from the perspective of, of an artist and creator, um, I am noticing now that there's this new sort of renaissance age sort of thing happening with organizations like Riverside has now come back. Uh, there are different organizations and initiatives taking place to address different needs in the community. I wanna continue to see more of that. And I wanted uh, to continue to see a, a more collaboration between those organizations, more synergy. Um, and of course, making sure that those organizations are also have youth focused initiatives to, you know, again, to pour back into the students and to the younger generation. Um, and that's definitely what I, again, that's what I've noticed over time and I think that as we continue to grow, as we continue to listen, as we continue to uh, observe the, the needs of the community, I think uh, as long as we, for one, as our hearts are in the right place, as long as 
we are collectively communicating. I think you, you, you spoke about issues earlier, uh, and through my observations, one of the key issues that I've uh, learned is there's a lack of, lack of communication, there's a lack of accessibility, there's a lack of, uh, of, of certain voices being silenced, and that's why, for me at least, I like to specifically focus on the black and brown communities and uplift the marginalized communities in this area, because you know, as someone who is marginalized myself, who, who, who occupies various ma marginalized intersections, I think that's a uh, priority for me. So I think if we continue to do or have initiatives that also uplift those marginalized communities uh, and to give them a voice, give them a platform to listen to their needs, then we'll definitely be on the right track. But it's gonna take, it's easier said than done, so, but it's gonna take a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I wanna open this question up to all of you. Where do the kids hang out in Ipsy? What does a safe space look like in Ipsy? And what will that safe space look like in Ipsy when it's built? Where do the kids hang out? I know some of them, yeah. right? The library, mm -hmm. yeah. the bus station here on Pearl. Yeah. Where do the kids hang out? I, I was gonna say the library and the bus, bus station in Pearl, um, but <laughs> also there's, you know, with the, with the Ozone House, a lot of kids are hanging out around there, and those really seem like the only three main areas that they're hanging out with, which, which is a shame. Um, that's just what the resources that they have right now uh, in, in downtown that, that feel welcome. So my students hang out at Park Ridge and I think that um, I appreciate that my school social worker is also a program manager there, right? So when they leave the stressors or the stress Stressing, stressful environment of school, they can go to a community um, center where people are providing them and exposing them to opportunities such as like field trips and games and truly building the whole child, right? I think education is something like once you're holistically okay, education is, I think, easy. It's a layer. So I appreciate Park Ridge and I think that sometimes they're not given the credit that they deserve um, because when our, our black children are being um, criminalized and are going to jail, whatever is happening, there's also another end that's committed to making sure that they're supported and productive. And I want to add to that, yes, definitely, because Park Ridge has been extremely supportive in a lot of different initiatives and uh, they often go unseen. They do, they, uh, they do a lot of thankless work. There are people there who do community gardens, who do uh, bat, like a lot of grassroots stuff that you don't, uh, where it doesn't, it's not, uh, you know, that a lot of people, again, don't see. Uh, but the impact is there, the, the hearts are in the right place, and there's a genuine interest in making sure that, you know, that, that community has a voice and that the students have a safe space to be themselves. And I've, seen, I've witnessed that, and it's truly powerful, yeah. So um, I run a campsite in the Sugarbrook neighborhood, which is at Grace Fellowship Church. Um, through the Washtenaw County Summer Playground Program, which is an initiative that launched in 2008. It was pretty much relaunched last year. Um, and so this is my second year as site supervisor. So we service children between five and 11 years old in full day programs in West Willow, Sugarbrook, and in Superior. Um, it is a free program um, and it's you know open to anyone. There's no type of verification checks or anything like that. Um, but I often don't know where my children go after because they're young. These are our little ones. So, you know, once they get to seventh, eighth grade and on, we, you know, you kind of get your wings a little bit. You can kind of move around the city a little bit and do what you need to do, what you kind of want to do, check in with your parents. It's a different time than it was when I was a kid. Because when I was a kid, my grandfather sat on the porch all day and I rode my bike back and forth. Um, but I don't know where, where a lot of these kids go and so, even a few parents have said, well, are there any aftercare programs? Because my program is at four o'clock. They need care till six, you know? So I really don't know where the younger kids go, but I do know like e Eastern Michigan University has the Bright Futures program, which has supported uh, two of the school buildings that I've worked in. Um, I worked for about 11 years in outreach at Girl Scouts. So they have outreach programs that are in the schools. So there are things and places for kids to go, but like we've said before, Everything is in a silo, it's in a vacuum. It's the, everybody wants to do the same thing. It's like everybody's got a cape on. Let's save the kids, but nobody's really trying to figure out the interest, the balance, and how everything 
kind of needs to mesh out. Child care is definitely an issue in Washington County. Um, I know that there's always a waiting list at the Washington Intermediate School District, but um, luckily right here in Ypsilanti, for those that don't know, we do have the collaborative. It's a partnership with Ypsilanti Community Schools, Eastern Michigan University, and they're actually in Chapel School over in the Normal Park neighborhood. So that's a wonderful collaboration um, where people, excuse me, and the YMCA. They're, they're huge drivers for this in our county. So I'm really uh, commending their work as well. I think this is a great time to collect cards for any of you that have questions out there for our panel. Anybody have cards? Perhaps we can just open it up and let them go at them. You guys are Yeah, my card is kind of all over the place, so. Um, some of the things that y'all were talking about in terms of thinking about where we are now, um, I hear a lot of people kind of are like feeling hopeless, depressed, like where are we going to go from here? Can you start thinking? Oh, thank you. Um, Thinking about kind of where we are today in the state of affairs, there's so many areas where I think people feel without hope. Like they just see things and feel depressed about where we are now and aren't sure kind of those next steps. Um, and a lot of you talked about collaboration. I'm, ex I'm interested in hearing uh, who do we think we need to be collaborating with to address the needs of the young people in our schools. And also when we think about kind of how do we manage this reputation and thinking about um, knowing that this is a valuable place to live. I think there are a lot of people who are here who do feel that way and who are afraid that depending on who's telling the story, it changes the face of Ypsilanti. So I'm interested in hearing about that, especially because I think the biggest hope that we would have is to be able to have young people come through our schools and graduate be able to get a job, be able to go to EMU, right, that we create this pipeline for them and then that they can come back into the community. Because I've heard a lot of stories where people are leaking out, right, where people get to that space, aren't able to get paid for doing the kind of community-engaged work that they're doing, and then they leave. They go to U of N, they go to Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so we're losing a lot of those folks. So I'm interested in hearing thoughts you have. I was a deserter. <laughs> Um, because I, I won't say that I never felt that Ypsilanti wasn't a valuable place to live. It just didn't offer me the type of lifestyle that I wanted to live. And when I look at job postings, I check job postings a lot. And when I look at job postings on what requirements are, and of course this is across the nation, requirements are for jobs in this area, what they require and what they pay don't balance out to me. I'm not about to do all of this for $12 an hour. What? Um, but <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm an expensive person, <laughs> but I, and I'm just, I'm being, I'm, I'm very real. So I don't want to feel like, I don't feel like there's hopelessness here. I feel like there is hope, but the hope is just kind of, it's cloudy. It's a cloudy day and the sun's got to come out. But, um, I think you said something about, you know, the changing the face of Ipsy. We need to make sure that the campaigns and, uh, the things that go out about Ipsy include all the vo as many voices as possible for whatever that situation calls for. Um, and collaborating, one thing, we talk about Eastern all the time, great. Eastern Michigan University is a great educational institution, but we don't talk about the other educational institutions that sit in Washtenaw County. We don't talk about Concordia, we don't talk about Cleary, and we don't talk about Washtenaw Community College, which most of their student base comes from Ypsilanti. So there are resources there that need to be tapped into um, because that, is, that could offer a great resource for those students who may not want to go to a four-year school or who may want to, you know, cut their income a little bit and, or cut their college costs a little bit and go to a community college, build their GPA and move on or need to figure some things out. But we don't talk about the other educational institutions. These colleges are leaking money and they need to put it into Ypsilanti. So in regards to collaboration, I don't necessarily think we need like a savior mentality. Like people need to come. I feel
into Ipsy, I don't, I actually don't believe that. When I talk about collaboration, I'm talking about people within the community, like genuinely and effectively collaborating with one another. So even when I think about the school system, everybody being on the same page, right? If we're educating students and providing equitable experiences, then every single person who is employee of YCS need to fundamentally believe that. Like that's the type of collaboration that I'm talking about. And then when I think about like, I'm gonna go on a soapbox, get on my soapbox. So when I think about, we gave a car away in June to a senior uh, and live was not there. Um, my students graduated on June 12th, and Live wasn't there. Um, they asked for us to provide information to release an article. And I think those are the type of things that bother my soul. But when one of my students make a poor choice, um, their, their name is blasted on MLive about being a criminal or coming from the south side of Ypsilanti or coming from Ypsilanti Community Schools. And those are the things that bother my soul, because then I have to ask you, like, what is your agenda, yeah. right? And, and, and that's the type of core collaboration that I don't want to see. And there may be, like, there may be a reason for that. It could be low staff, whatever, but let's make the effort and let's just have a balance of media. Like, that's where I struggle. But yeah. yeah, I think we have the people, we just actually need to be on the same page. Um, hope is one of my favorite words. Uh, as someone, I remember one of the reasons that I started Hero Nation, for one, is because, I, like I said, I've always been a fan of superheroes. I grew up, you know, loving m my first superhero uh, with my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I was introduced to other, like, fictional superheroes, like, you know, Superman, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, all the other heroes. Uh, and that opened up a whole, whole new door for me. In fact, superheroes like saved my life. That's why I'm so serious about what I do. I, I really genuinely believe in this mission and what Hero Nation stands for. And then in 2016, when the election happened, uh, I went into this state of depression. I mean, let's be honest, let's talk about mental health. Uh, I was depressed for a very long time. Um, and to, I, as I was climbing out of that state of darkness and mock and, and, and filth, I asked myself, well, what can I do? I can't just sit here, what can I do? How can I take action um, and in, in the best way that I know how or in a way that I feel like I, could be, I can contribute somewhere? And so that was sort of uh, the birth of Hero Nation, hoping to instill hope in certain people, in certain communities. Like, I remember even talking to some students about, yeah, what is a superhero? They're like, I don't know. Like, yeah, that's not lame, no, but I'm like, well, and I tried to, you know, ground it, you know, a bit more to re really get them to dig into themselves. So I always do this exercise with people when I ask them to, uh, to sort of go into themselves and find their, their, the hero version of themselves. Like, for example, if you close your eyes right now, I want you to imagine yourself in this really dark forest, in this really dark area. Um, and ahead of you is this light, this light that is calling you, that is super warm, but it is powerful and it's calling your name. And as you're walking towards it, there's obstacles in your way. There are uh, trials and tribulations coming towards you. Maybe whatever it is, maybe it's financial insecurity, maybe it's, it's, it's home insecurity, maybe it's, it's, it's family, maybe it's, it's friends or toxic in a toxic environment, work, I don't know, but the light is still calling you. And as you get towards that light, it, it's stronger, you feel more emboldened, you feel empowered, and then you finally touch the light, it transforms you, it consumes you. And whatever the end product of that is, of that transformation is, that is the hero version of yourself. That is the ultimate version of you. And that's what got me through a lot of hard times when I was young. I used to manifest, I had to literally manifest my depression, manifest, you know, whatever dark, dark thoughts I was going through, this, you know, insecurities, I had to manifest that and make it an enemy that I could defeat. Uh, and so that's what I'm, you know, that's at the heart of what Hero Nation stands for. That's why we do what we do. And even now, but, you know, a little plug, but uh, as we're continuing to do more outreach and, you know, we saw the impact that we, uh, we had at the school with, uh, with Black Panther, I want to continue to do more of that. And so right now we're looking for additional, uh, we're just, 
developing a video game scholarship program uh, called Gaming Warriors, where we're essentially trying to help fund the education of youth through video games. They love video games, everyone's always on their phones, and it's a, it's a, competitive, a competitive program. And so the, the mission of that program is to help build an inclusive community of young gamers. You wanna teach them these important social emotional skills. We wanna teach them empathy. We wanna teach them how to be leaders in a space that they're familiar with, so video games and stuff like that, while still funding the education uh, of youth. And so uh, hope, like I said, is my favorite word because I truly believe in what it stands for. I truly believe, I've seen it in people's eyes, I see it in their hearts, I see it at Ipsy Glow, I see it at Park Ridge, I see it in a variety of different initiatives in Niftalani. When they, when the kids get excited about something, when they get truly ecstatic, their, their hearts begin to glow, the, you begin to see it, you, be, you begin to feel it. And, um, but yeah, that is happening here and I'm, I'm seeing it, so yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I could ever follow up with after that. Um, but, but um, you know, we're, I'm, I'm up here talking about collaboration a lot and um, I've been doing First Fridays for six years, about six years. Um, and the thing is, is that I can never be at this point where I've collaborated enough. Um, you, it's just with, with First Fridays, we, so we do a, a monthly art event. So we put on, we put on one event and then next thing we're working on the next one. So there's a lot of sitting here right now and realizing like, shit, we really don't have as much kids coming out as we should to First Fridays. We should be figuring out ways to get them here with, with transportation. Uh, the events here are free. Um, they're put on by, um, by, by anybody in the community. They're free events and, and um, it's just, there's just a constant, um, need to, especially with my organization, to keep growing and, and um, get, everyone, get everyone here to enjoy it. Do we have any other questions out there? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Eric and I'm uh, born in Ypsilanti and I've recently returned from Ann Arbor. Thank you, I'm so glad to be back. But I would, like, I would like the panelists to imagine what one idea that would help us connect these silos to improve awareness and communication so that we can move on to collaboration in the future. Uh, I, I'm the first one to say that Concentrate and On the Ground it, Ipsy has done a phenomenal job, not just in the meaty stories and the human interest things, but we need a media source coming out of Ypsilanti. And I've, um, you know, I've heard about some initiatives happening through EMU, um, in, in, uh, Decky Alexander's office. Um, there was actually a startup gentleman who was at A2Y Chamber today. They're talking about building out a platform to figure out not just all the, the hundreds of community events that are happening monthly, but also who is the contact person for it? Where is the source for it? Are there scholarships for it? Um, just a one main source that we could see that happen. And it, I've seen a couple of initiatives start up and fall through over the last two and a half years. And so whether it's the library who's a big player in distributing information or through the school district, it has to happen. Um, I want to talk about new uh, with Yodit. Uh, recently, she did the uh, Leaders of Color initiative, where she um, that, that organization uh, gathered uh, different leaders in the community to do uh, focus groups, where they wanted to, for one, define what a leader is. What does it mean? Uh, to be a leader, and especially within communities of color. Uh, and then the, uh, the follow-up, or the other part of the conversation was, well, what, how can we create an impact? How can we have an impact? What can be done to ensure that we are actually collaboration, collaborating, we're actually making a difference? And what does that, you know, how does that collaboration manifest? Does it collab uh, manifest within like an organization or an actual physical space? You know, what does that look like? And I think people are in, in the process of defining that right now. 
uh, especially for marginalized communities. Uh, so you know uh, that what that collaboration is going to be, and I think you know, given time, uh, we'll get to that point where we'll have more uh, a greater synergy between organizations and, and initiatives. It's always said that the revolution won't be televised, and that's true. So we're gonna have to look in other sources of media, and I think social media is a big thing, um, but I think that we actually need to teach proper use of social media so we can get social media specialists and managers out there that know how to work for their organization, get people engaged through social media so that they will come out. Um, and I think that that, I think social media is very, very important. A lot of people like to say it's not real life, but that's the complete opposite. It is indeed real life. Though people may filter their social media how they want to, it's very much still real life because people lose their jobs because of what they do on social media. People get jobs because of what they do on social media. So it's, of course, it's through whatever lens, but we have to, once again, tell our stories through our lens. And I think that social media, the organizations need to take their social media more seriously so that they can start to push out their information and it is um, captured by the demographics and the groups that they want to have captured. So I was also going to discuss media, but I also think a mind, mindset shift, right, in order to truly move forward with collaboration. I think that sometimes just in Ipsy, we can be very deficit based and I think we could be very negative about where we live but not really thinking about the solutions um, in order to combat the negative right like if there's something that's a, a gap what needs to be true in order to make sure that it isn't a gap anymore and I think that we can talk about problems all the time but if we're not proactive it just becomes like overwhelming because there's problems everywhere so I think media mindset sh a mindset shift I think those two things can allow us to at least begin to move forward. And it doesn't have to be transformational. I think people always want to think big picture, which is great, but like let's take small steps like and get the small wins. I think those that's very important as well. I have a question on a card. What sort of business or establishment would you like to see in downtown to promote younger people engaging with or generally connecting with Ipsy? business or establishment? Um, I would say, again, me being a, being a nerd, um, speaking to my fellow nerds out there, what's up y'all? How you doing, how you doing? Um, I, an arcade space, like I, I imagine like. That's what I was just saying. Huh? huh? Remember internet cafe? <laughs> yes. yes. When the internet wasn't yeah. in everybody's house? That was a big deal mm -hmm. when I was growing up and you met at the internet cafe and there were, there were things to do and you chilled there. And that's where I met my first real boyfriend at an internet cafe. You know what those are? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents are like, we don't know what those are. Yeah, no, but um, you know. Ziggy's. Yes, Ziggy's. Okay, yep, yep. And like, I was thinking too, um, like say for example, if maybe one day Hero Nation might get a physical space, uh, it, I imagine it being an area where there's comic books, there's literature everywhere, there's video games, arcade cabinets, like a, and we're, we're also, again, uh, solidifying the mission to uplift and create a safe space for marginalized communities, including people of color, LGBTQ people, people with disabilities, and women, and so how can we do that in that space? And I think that's, you know, that's what I imagine, something like that being, you know, president, you know, and I think there are some initiatives or businesses right now who are doing something like that, but I think, uh, I, I, again, the issue is accessibility and communication, like maybe some of the students don't know that, that it, it exists and then it's for them. Someone, I'm sorry, someone talked about transportation and of course we know that southeastern Michigan has a huge mass transportation issue. Well, Michigan, I mean, we built the cars. Why wouldn't everybody have a car? Um, but everybody doesn't have a car and there was a long time in life where I struggled where I didn't have a car and I absolutely dreaded taking the bus because it should not take me two hours to get to Briarwood. All I wanted to do was go to Claire's. So, um, I think that we have to expand the opportunities for transportation um, for companies like Ubers and Lyfts to come in, um, Kids Cab, these type of companies to come in and transport our children around. Um, I have kids that walk to my camp. 
I don't particularly feel comfortable with that. Honestly, I don't. And I have kids who wait in the darkness for buses to come in the morning. I don't particularly feel comfortable with that either. But I think that a space, ideally, would be like the greatest community center that there ever was, where there's computers, there's books, there's resources, there's places for kids to be athletic, you know? Um, and the building that Ypsilanti Community Middle School was once housed in, the pool was like, it was the bee's knees. Everybody wants to get in the pool. Yeah, it was an, it's a beautiful pool. And, but that's a place that kids should be able to have access to. Um, and it should be like, back in the day, I had the Boys and Girls Club, and I know they're over at the Old Chapel School, but I had the Boys and Girls Club. We had access to things, and I was a child, I was eight years old 20 years ago. So in 20 years, the landscape of childhood, okay, <laughs> has shifted. Um, <laughs> So I think that we really need to think about these community partners and these people and these colleges that have money. They need to build a space to keep our kids safe and to keep them entertained. Jerry Rosenberg, I, my question to that is how utilized are the schools after hours or during summers, uh, to, if at all, as a community center? So, I mean, there's tons of structures here already. I'm with you about a community center. To me, a creative community center, an active multiple, multi-use space mm -hmm. for all kinds of needs, including food. <laughs> and it seems like the schools my, it's a question, I, more than anything, the schools generally in the past have posed as a center for the community. It's a natural place, it's, it can be a, um, a safe place. Mm -hmm. Transportation isn't hard to get to because it's set up that way already. So why not the schools? So I can't speak to every school, but what I do appreciate about Dr. Emmonson, superintendent of schools, and his leadership is that Ypsilanti Community High School houses y YMCA, Bright Futures, Upward Bound, Summer School. Um, so on any given day in the summer, there's hundreds of kids from four years old to juniors in high school um, using that space in different capacities. So I can't yeah, so. And it sounds like what you just suggested is to not only exist, there's a need. Are we replicated or absorbed? Yeah, and I think that also just com over communicating information. You're a community member and didn't know that, right? And, and if you knew that, maybe something will happen in the elementary schools or the middle schools and things of that sort. So disseminating com information, um, but I do appreciate YCS for housing uh, that opportunity and also making sure that it's feasible for parents. Their kids already um, live in that community and so they can still have something to do during the summer. Uh, going back to, to things in, in Ypsilanti that, um, we'd love, that I would like to see for kids, um, we did mention the arcade, obviously that was one of my, I would have to go to Ann Arbor to go um, to Pinball Pete's, um, and that was a treat because we had nothing like that where I grew up. Um, I would have to come here for putt putt because we didn't have anything I, uh, where I grew up either. So um, having having obviously those spaces, but um, and we did mention that yes, there is an arcade in, in Ypsilanti, but it is also you know a bar. Is there you know could we have something that? is open, you know, till eight or nine, a little bit later for the older kids, but doesn't have, you know, isn't a bar environment. Uh, there's nothing like that around here. I'm also really excited for uh, Tinker Tech that's opening. Um, they are doing a lot of workshops and classes, and I think they're, they're partnering with, um, with the youth and, and the schools, I believe. Um, so I've heard, but um, 
and, and doing free, free like uh, learn how to solder classes during first Friday. So you can walk in and, and make something. And um, that, that's just, that's a really, that's really cool. Like I, I wish that as a kid I could have had some experience in, in learning that, you know, small electronics weren't a scary thing or like a boys thing. It's, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited for, for a uh, company like that to come here and uh, hopefully more, more things like that, makerspaces come to fruition here. Um, I do want to speak to the infrastructure of what's in place with the schools. I'm, I'm producing Ipsy Glow this year, so I do expect to heavily utilize the network within the schools. And one of the things, that besides all of this, the great um, programs that are happening in Ypsilanti Community High School and Meet Up and Eat Up, where um, children under 18 years old get to eat Monday through Friday, at least one meal a day um, for no cost, is that there's, um, I can speak from a place of having worked at YCS a couple years ago, is that there are so many programs and so many social um, programs and resources being doled out, but there's not enough capacity within the staff at YCS to handle all of the requests. And there's no way around that when there's so many hours in the day and you want to help more kids and there's just not enough time in the day to distribute everything that's available. So I think, you know, the infrastructure is there. The school is getting filled. It's being activated. The people that care are volunteering. They're being paid through senior programs, but there's just not enough time in the day. But it's there. That network is there. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you, Concentrate. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yen, for moderating tonight. And thanks to all the panelists. A big round of applause for all of them. Um, before we get out of here, I'm obligated to thank all of our great sponsors for the On the Ground Ipsy program. Uh, Washtenaw County, Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation, Destination Ann Arbor, Eastern Michigan University, WEMU, the Ypsilanti Downtown Development Authority, the City of Ypsilanti, Depot Town Merchants, the Downtown Association of Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Regional Chamber, Spark, Ypsilanti Township, Ann Arbor Area Transit Authority, Habitat for Humanity of Huron Valley, Michigan Works. Oh, that's it. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. One last round of applause for these guys. Oh, uh, so again, FYI, uh, so I spoke about the video game program for Hero Nation that we're trying to launch in the fall uh, in collaboration with the Bright Future, so it's an after school program. Uh, so what we're collecting right now are emails. Uh, so we're, we're planning to launch the crowdfunding campaign pretty soon. And so again, the program is an initiative where we're trying to build an inclusive community of young gamers uh, and empower and educate them through video games. And so the program will be a 16 day initiative where the students will learn how to play uh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, um, so like a, a, a popular a game based on popular anime characters, um, and they'll learn again valuable social emotional skills, leadership skills, teamwork, uh, empathy, learning how to navigate a safe space. Uh, and on the last day of the program, uh, the grand prize winner will receive a scholarship. Uh, second and third place will receive uh, other prizes as well. But they'll, we're trying to make sure that they're also centered or centralized education, or they have educational value. Uh, so again, talking about the synergy and uh, what you know, us working within YCS, we want to do our part to make sure that Hero Nation has a voice there too. So again, the email sign-up sheet is over there. There are also flyers as well. So please spread the word. We really want to launch this program. We really want to help. So thank you. And when you're signing up for that on the way out, we also have a survey on the event if you want to give us any feedback on the event. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.